This week on Cool Story with Brie and Bridie, we talk about an extraordinary photo exhibition a year on from the women's uprising in Iran, listening to Taylor Swift in prison, and why do people have babies when they're so expensive and the world is burning? This is Cool Story. I'm Brie Lee. And I'm Bridie Jabor. Bridie, what have you been up to this week? Well, I had a big, well, I didn't have the oaf husband moment. My husband had the oaf husband What's moment. What's the oaf husband moment? It's when it, the oaf husband is when they just do the most cliched, unthinking, oaf-ish thing. Oh, yeah. My dad, who is not an oaf, knits beautiful blankets and he's knitted them for, he's really good at it and he's knitted many beautiful blankets for all his kids and grandchildren and he and various friends' babies. And my friend Miranda knows this and requested that he knit a blanket in the Panthers' colours for her husband, <laughs> Collie, for his birthday, which is this week. Beautiful surprise, beautiful idea. I asked my dad if he would do it uh, and he wrote back, no, full stop. And then, of course, rang me two months later and said, um, how big is this suitcase you're bringing to Grafton because I've got that blanket. <laughs> oh, cute. <laughs> Which is so nice. And so I brought it back with me last month when I went to Grafton. I brought the blanket back with me. It's like big, like for a queen size bed, big blanket. That's a fucking huge yeah. blanket to knit. Yeah, massive. He, I think he sits there knitting, watching the races, <laughs> enjoying his life. Than with no children in the house. A man he, of contradictions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's thriving. <laughs> <laughs> and so I brought it back and Miranda came around, but she walked to my house and I showed her the blanket and she loved it and it's so beautiful, came up so well. Uh, and then I said, don't carry it all the way home because it'll be annoying to carry. Just come and pick it up in the car or I'll drop it off. And, she's, and she said, yep, no worries. So I had the blanket sitting in the study. On Saturday oh, night, no. I'm, oh, on no. Saturday night, Maddie Q goes and watches the footy at the pub with a bunch of mates. Something bad's gonna happen, and and I'm at home. Something bad's gonna happen. Yeah, something bad happened. I had to look after my kids on a Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the torture. So I I get them to sleep, and I'm doing my nice private, alone, Saturday night things at 10.30 at night, which is sitting on the couch in my house clothes, you know, no bra, completely comfortable, watching the Taylor Swift reputation talk. <laughs> You're thriving. <laughs> yeah, I'm thriving. <laughs> this is what I like to do when I'm alone. And then 10.30, Matt comes through the front door and uh, I said, Hey, and then I hear another voice say, hey, and I look up and there's Collie seeing me in all my private time glory watching in the middle of watching Taylor Swift reputation. I said, hey, what are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I just dropped um, Matt home. And Matt said, yeah, and I told him to come get the blanket. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> it's like, you what? What a fucking idiot <laughs> what an oaf and I was like what and Collie just looked really confused and because Miranda it is a running joke between us that Miranda always leaves things behind at our house whenever she comes over she will leave behind like coats bag I think she's left her phone before like she she just loves to leave stuff behind at our house shoes so it's like it's a very it's like a theme and Matt was so proud of himself for thinking well they've got the car they can take the blanket and I said that's a surprise. And Matt's like, what? And Collie is just dying laughing in the background <laughs> because he knows. I'm like, it's a present. And obviously he knows it's his birthday this week. You're like, it's a present and, and I'm not even wearing a bra. <laughs> and I'm watching a tour from five years ago on a Saturday night. Um, and Collie was just howling with laughter and I was like, well, and I was like, you might as well take it. I think Matt had already picked it up or whatever oh and God. walked in straight to the study and picked it up. And Matt was just so devastated because he was trying to do something smart and thinking and, you know, remembering what's been left behind and getting it out of the house. And instead he like completely spoiled Collie's birthday surprise. You know, when it comes to men, I find myself increasingly uninterested in their intentions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Me and Matt have a, jo have a joke. I think it's from a meme, but it's like, you know, when, when you 
sometimes ask them, what are you thinking? Or Matt will make a face. And I'm like, what do you, like, I'll suggest something and he'll make a face. And I'll be like, what does that face mean? What do you actually want? Do you want to do it or not? And there's some meme that's like the woman saying, what are you thinking? And the man being like, literally nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's also a running joke between me and Maddie Q. And I'm like, what are you thinking? He's like, literally nothing. Nothing. <laughs> The running joke in our household, this is maybe a bit too niche or nerdy because my husband and I are both from law backgrounds. I talk about men being negligent all the time because I'm not interested in whether or not your intentions were good. If your execution was so piss poor because most of your life you can get away with doing like the bare minimum and the bar is so low, what is the outcome? We are a strict liability household. <laughs> Oh my god! I could not be strict liability house. I would not here. His head is in the clouds. Wait, he's on. He's on his own planet. And my second child is exactly the same. And I, you have to understand what you marry. <laughs> I married a man on his own planet. Yeah, I should say the strict liability thing is also just more of when I'm like at home just raging about something that's happened or like the state of the world or some latest fucking <laughs> whatever. Strict liability for everyone except Maddie Q. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have to defer that decision to Miranda. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was, oh, she's so cool. She's so laid back. Like I messaged her the next day and said sorry and she just laughed because she loves the blanket so much. She's like, no worries, I've spoiled enough surprises in my time as well. Don't worry about it. He loves the blanket. <laughs> uh, and it was beautiful. a very thoughtful present in which my dad had to do all the work, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, this is yeah. Yeah, yeah, very thoughtful of her to get my dad to do all the work. Yeah. <laughs> what have you been up to this week? Okay, <clears throat> in a change of gears, <laughs> I got to go to the media preview for a new exhibition that's now showing at the Art Gallery of New South Wales here in Sydney. But it is this is not a sort of anecdote or a description that is only relevant to Sydney people. It's the first major showing of the works of the photographer Hoda Afshar, who I think is the most exciting photographer currently working in Australia. And as part, the reason it was like relevant that I got to go to a media preview is that the artist herself, Afshar, was speaking to these works. And there are, I want to say what, like one, two, three, four, five or six bodies of her work from the last decade that show in deliberate order. And there are three in particular I want to mention. The first is that she, the image she's most famous for and what people might have seen of hers is that haunting image of Beirut's Buchani on Manus Island. Ah, yes. Yep. And that was part of the series of those men who were imprisoned on Manus. But this exhibition also includes um, newly commissioned works to mark the fact that it has been a year since the women's uprising and protests in Iran. A year. Like, I, I know it sounds like maybe stupid to say this, but I can't believe it's been 12 months since that happened. I can't believe that either. Do you know what else it's 12 months since this week? What? Since Liz Truss was sworn in as Prime Minister by Queen Elizabeth. Wow. That was 12 months ago as well. Funny things are happening to time at the moment because I also can't believe those protests for 12 months ago. ago. Yeah. So these new works that have been commissioned, they are beautiful and they're huge. Um, they are very affecting and they show very simply, um, or I'm describing them simply, they're not simple works, but women braiding each other's hair and white doves in various states of sort of flight. And Afshar was explaining to us that if the, the women braiding each other's hair, if they did that in Iran, they would could be arrested and killed. And the white doves were because when so many young people were killed during those protests and uprisings, especially a young person in particular, when they were killed the families would release white doves in the street as you know a marker as a, a like a ritual to, oh to God, mark their tragic. deaths yeah and thinking of those things and standing before these images that are just so beautiful and specific and have so much meaning in them and hearing the artist talk about how she really works with her subjects is extraordinary. The third part of her work that I really want to talk about because it was so um, profound 
is a series that ha- was taken. She doesn't disclose what city it was taken in for deliberate reasons, but she was invited to an underground, both sort of metaphorically and literally underground, bathhouse for gay men. And a lot of her work is about deciding very carefully what to reveal and what to conceal. And these images from this bathhouse have steam in them that isn't like obviously like naturally occurring in this the, with the showers and the baths. And the way she has worked with that steam makes them beautiful, but also very sort of clever and subtle. And then there's also this graininess to the images. And Afshar was talking about how normally when a photographer has canisters of film and they go on internet or like they have to fly on a plane, they will put their film reels canisters in special bags so that they don't get exposed to the x-ray machines for security or they will declare the reels of film and have security like physically check their stuff rather than put them through the machines but she was so nervous that these rolls of film would be like discovered and compromise the um, identities of the men who trusted her to take these photos that she just sent them through the x-ray machine and the result is this graininess and like degradation of the film. Oh, my God. Which then you can – I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about this series in particular. You can then see that graininess but it just like further works into this like conceal reveal tension that she's playing with and it's just this – It is such a special exhibition. It's on for several months now here in Sydney at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. This is the photographer Hoda Afshar. The exhibition is called um, A Curve is a Broken Line. And it's also going to be touring to at least, I think it's going to, I think it will tour around and I really hope it does. But we know for sure it will at least be touring to Brisbane next year to the um, University of Queensland Art Gallery around the middle of the year. Fantastic. And can we look at them online as well? Yes. And like, I know this is, if if nothing else, if you are listening to this, just go follow her on Instagram. We'll link her in yep, the show, in the show notes. notes because her work has such a rich and consistent commitment to truth telling and justice and community and also is just exquisite and beautiful and clever and smart and fantastic. I don't think I've ever heard you use so many superlatives. Superlatives? <gasps> superlatives! <laughs> superlatives. <Friday>. Superlatives. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's so just so good. It's just so good. And I think there's this rule of thumb that you're not supposed to, like, talk about really visual things on a podcast, but I don't care. Like, oh, you all need to go and look I'm, at her I'm thrilled. Work. I cannot yeah. wait to go and see it yeah. and um, find her more of her work online as well. Well, while you were – been very moved by the, this fo- photograph exhibition. I was watching more TV. <laughs> I actually watched a very moving show. What? That should have gone viral when it was released. Viral so, for a moving show? For oh, for what? For a movie show? Mo- no, like, sorry, I should let you finish. It's, yeah, you know, well, you know how, like, Fleabag went viral? Oh, true, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I yeah. feel like okay. Iggy and Ace, it's called Iggy and Ace, it's on SBS On Demand. I think it's about six episodes, but every episode is between 10 and 15 minutes long. It's Australian made. It is so funny and it is also so emotional in parts. It's about two queer best friends who are alcoholics and one of them gets sober and it's about how it affects their friendship and there's some really very, very funny parts in it and also very, very sad and very it seems very real parts in it and also a representation of – the queer community and how they gather together and support each other and what is what can be so unique and special about that community depicted on screen in a way that I really have not seen very much, which is also mostly around a funeral, not of one of the main characters, so that's not a spoiler. And I just found it a really extraordinary show and I can't believe it didn't get rave five-star reviews everywhere and picked up. I think it came out last year and I watched it because I know a couple of the people involved in the creation of it and my friend Monica went to Perth during lockdowns when the border was shot to film it. She directed some episodes 
And I knew at the time she was doing it and I thought it sounded interesting. But then by the time it came out, I was on a three-month bender. So (laughs) (laughs) uninterested in watching a show about sobriety. (laughs) Well, you know that time when all the COVID restrictions were properly lifted last year, we all all went to dress up birthday parties. We all had something on. We all had a party on it every weekend and we were all just obsessed with seeing each other in real life. So I just didn't watch that much TV. And now I finally got around to it. I watched the entire series in two nights and loved it, everyone. And it obviously free to access because it's SBS on demand, so highly recommend. Did I hear you right that you just said it was like 10 to 15-minute episodes? Yeah. they're Or well, some of them I think are like even seven minutes. Like they're very short episodes, it's like a mini series, I guess. That's so interesting. Yeah, and done really well. What they squeeze in an 11-minute episode and how it's done is so clever. Hmm. That's interesting. I'd never heard of that. Or like I, I was not aware that that content could be good. <laughs> yeah, this totally. Is like, and I'm outing yeah. myself here for like n- narrow-mindedness. But if I saw that a show was supposedly in that format, that would be a reason that I would be skeptical of it and would probably not watch it unless I got a direct recommendation for it. I watch them a little bit, but they're just really hard to pull off. But when when it works, it's amazing. And it's also great to be able to watch something in like 15-minute chunks. Mm. This has been like 15 minutes of stalling before Bridie can talk about uh, Taylor Swift. Talk which- more about <laughs> Taylor Swift. I already got to talk to her about, talk about her at the beginning. I snuck it in. <laughs> Episode six and finally Bridie's talking about Taylor Swift. <laughs> When we first began this show in the back of my mind and in every episode since, I've been wondering how long until Bridie will find a way (laughs) for us to talk about Taylor Swift. Well, this is a legit reason because this article went a bit viral this week and it's, it's the first article in a few months that I've seen lots of different people talking about. It's in The New Yorker. The title of it is something like Listening to Taylor Swift in Prison. It's a long read and it had maybe the best opening paragraph, opening sentence of a feature that I have read in years. Mm -hmm. And the opening sentence is, the first time I heard about Taylor Swift, I was in a Los Angeles County jail waiting to be sent to prison for murder. Yep. Yep. Now that is just setting up so many things that we're going to read about in this story. And essentially it's about this man, Joe Garcia, who is an incredible writer and is serving a life sentence for murder, which kind of revealed in the first sentence. He served about 20 years. So he went to jail when he was 33 and now he's in his 50s. Also just think for a moment, imagine how much the world has changed on the outside in the two decades. What are two decades to be in prison? Well, this is one of the things I loved about it was how specific and quotidian it was. One of the things he tracks across those years, and I mean, there's so much good about this article. It's like a masterclass in like long form narrative journalism, I think. He tracks, obviously, time passes with the new Taylor Swift albums in certain years, but he also details what music devices he had to try and get his hands on in order to listen to them in the different prisons. This is what I found so fascinating about this piece. You know, I already know that Taylor Swift is a genius. (laughs) I don't, don't need to be told that. What I loved about this piece was the insight into daily realities of a prisoner in jail in America and all the little ways they've stripped of dignity. Yes. And how difficult things are, really simple things are, such as listening to the radio. Mm. And one of the fascinating things that um, he gave an insight into was how he found out about each album. You know, they don't just get to listen to the news every day or obviously scroll Instagram and see an announcement. So he would find out about albums, you know, a week or two weeks after They'd been announced and it would all depend on what they'd been allowed to watch on TV that day and if it came up in the program that they were watching. And which particular prison he was being held in and what level of security it was at that time. Yeah, and so level of security meant whether he was allowed to have an MP3 player in prison. And he detailed having his own stereo at one point and basically listening to most of Taylor Swift's CDs on physical CDs. I don't think I've ever listened to a Taylor Swift album on a physical CD. No. 
No, no. It's all been digital. digital. Yeah, because, you know, that's the last few years. But he's had to wait for physical CDs. He, re- he read the album notes, which yes. is like such a callback to when we were teenagers. I and did get that. the album. Yeah, Constantly. and it would tell you something. It would tell you a lot about the album. Yeah. And so he de- and he details that and also threaded through is his on and off contact with the, his girlfriend, or the woman he was in love with when he got sent to prison and his feelings it, about her and them going in and out of contact over the 20 years. Doesn't he call her his sweetheart? Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. There were like really moving parts in this and also so many funny bits. There's this scene that um, he Joe Garcia describes where he's been moved to a different prison facility and, you know, that's always like a bit of a nervous time when you're figuring out who your new sort of clique or crew will be. And he goes out into the exercise yard and he finds his crew. I'm pretty sure in the article he says he's Asian and Hispanic and he yep. finds a, a group of Asian guys in particular who are working out and these become his new friends. And they're like working out in the prison yard discussing like the merits of different Taylor Swift albums. And listen to this. One of his mates disagrees about whether like one of the more recent albums is good. And I quote, because he considered it a misguided pop departure from the country greatness of Fearless and Speak Now. (laughs) (laughs) And he does write so well about Taylor Swift herself as a songwriter and her music as well. That is another thread running through this article that is done. so, And it's very hard to say something original about her, especially this year considering like the saturation is everywhere. Can I just interrupt briefly? The reason I think this was extra special was because he does not have access to this like absolute dissection minutia of celebrity news. He doesn't like – know what all the Swifties know about her, like the dates of her boyfriends and when she was in Paris or what she was doing with the friendship with Carly Kloss and the road trip. Like he's not relating to her on that kind of biographical detailed level. He's appreciating her as a songwriter. But I think that that is at the core what most of her fans are appreciating her for as well because you – you know, you follow her little romances and her friendships and breakdowns. But when you're listening to her music, mostly you're not thinking about that stuff, I think. The reason that her music is so popular is because you can – she has this gift for writing about very specific experiences with very specific details like what someone was wearing, the kind of shoes they had on, and it can feel so – universal and so that's what when you're listening to her music you're thinking about your own life and your own experiences and I think that most fans are thinking that way when they're listening to it and then all of the gossip and stuff is just fun to read and chat to people about but the actual listening to her music experiences you know thinking about your own life and your own stuff ups or things that didn't go the way that you thought they would and I really loved and he put it well in there where he wrote in there Her problems compared to mine are champagne problems. Yeah. Which I thought was a great line. It is. And then, but then he's like, but the, but still, even though her problems compared to mine are champagne problems, I still feel that she's, I'm paraphrasing here, she's articulating emotions I have felt, experiences I've had, and how I felt about those experiences. And that is the power of her music at its core, beyond all the like gossip headlines and TikToks. Well, I took down one of his, the things he wrote because I explicitly, specifically wanted to ask you about it. He writes, there was in her voice something intuitively pleasant and genuine and good, something that implies happiness or at least the possibility of happiness. It's like, A, do you agree with that? And B, it's quite profound that a man in prison can find that in a pop superstar. It is very profound. And also the other I th- maybe unspoken thread that runs through this article that you can really – he doesn't say explicitly but he reveals again and again and again is how much thinking he's done in prison, mm-hmm. you know, losing the last 20 years of his life from 33 until 50s. And he's thought – he's spent a lot of time, you can tell, thinking, reflecting on his actions, reflecting on his life, reflecting on how he's treated – people, which Mm. I also found so profound. But that line in particular about her voice, 
hearing, I don't hear in her voice the possibility of happiness. I like listening to her sing her songs, obviously, but she's not a the strongest singer. She's a good singer, but she's not the strongest singer. That's not why she's famous. She's very Bob Dylan esque in that way, and I'm a big Bob Dylan fan as well. So you know, I guess the music that I really like is music that tells a story and um, talks about experiences and and emotions. Obviously, that's the a big type of music that I'm into, which I also think. Kanye West has done very well. Can I go you into well. a soundbite? Can I, <laughs> Bridie? Do you think Taylor Swift is the 21st century Bob Dylan? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I've I've been on the Guardian <laughs> podcast saying that she's our generation's poet laureate. <laughs> I do. I think she's got a lot in common with Dylan in that obviously can play their instruments. Very, very, very gifted songwriters. Not the strongest singers. Not even the strongest stage presence necessarily, although Taylor is part of putting on a great show, but the reason that they're famous and the reason that their careers have lasted so long is really truly down to the songwriting. The songwriting. Without yeah. the songwriting, they're nothing. I want to make one final point about this article, which is that I'm just going to try and articulate this. A lot of the criticism I see and hear and read about Taylor Swift in general seeks to dismiss her art because of the immensity of her privilege and the facets of her privilege are like real and valid and true. She is, you know, a thin, very rich, like straight presenting white woman. And there is something I think in, I, I think one of the reasons this article went as viral as it did is because here you have a man of color who is currently imprisoned, who like we don't get his whole kind of biographical origin story, which I think is a good thing. But here is a man who does in many ways is like the opposite of a lot of those privileges that Swift enjoys and has. And here is a man at the opposite end of the privilege spectrum saying that her work is excellent and like gives him hope in his life and praising her as a songwriter and saying that her work and her art is universal. And I think that is a big reason why this piece went viral. It is an incredible lens to see her work through. Yeah. For sure. Even though I already knew all those things about how good she is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Second article that has been doing the rounds this week more than a lot of other things is the one about babies. Yes. The big topic of the week seems to be babies because there are a couple of articles I saw a lot of different people sharing again and again and again. One of them was, I want you, but I can't afford you by Eloise Hendy. And the you is a baby. Mm. And this is in Stylist magazine. Um, it also had a, another headline online, which we'll link to in the show notes. And in it, she was talking about being in her thirties and not being able to have a baby because she can't afford it. And talking about the financial realities of that and she interviews a few other people about being in their 30s and, you know, thinking when they were younger that they would have a child or have a baby and then all of them basically the main driver behind their decision not to at this point is money yep. and not being able to afford it. And the big factors there are housing, Mm-hmm. Not being able to buy a house to live in, oh, see, like our ongoing theme every the week. Year, every week, something it, comes, it comes back up. to housing. Well, it's touching every it is. aspect of people's lives. Yep. So, how, not being able to afford a house, so renting and feeling that that is too unstable to have a baby when you're um, living in a rental because obviously you could have to move at any time, and also the price of childcare. Yep. She's in England. And she's writing just about England, but obviously a lot of it is very applicable to. Australia's situation. In it, she quoted Gina Rushton, who is listener and friend to me, friend to (laughs) us. She is a friend of mine, but she wrote this book. I actually wasn't that good of friends with her when she wrote this book. And in Australia, it's called The Most Important Job in the World. It's coming out in the UK and America as The Parenthood Dilemma, because they obviously needed a more literal title. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and it is an extraordinary book. When I first read this, I wasn't actually that good of friends with her. I had – it was marketed as making the decision to have a baby and analysing that decision with all the different factors, obviously money being one of them, but also – Environment. Was environment a was a huge one. She interviewed really – in a great part of the book, she interviewed climate scientists yes. and campaigners about how 
they have children when they know what the fate of the world is going to be. But also other factors come into it, like, you know, how do you want to set up your life? What's important to you? And she really interrogates why you would want a baby for yourself, like, and well, for her, like, you know, what emotions come into it. And as someone who had already made the decision, already had my kids, I found that book so extraordinary and it really changed the way that I thought about parenting and more specifically mothering Mm. and all the work around it. And I was just reading another review of it today on Insta from a woman who has already decided not to have kids. She's not moving on the question. She knows she's not going to have them. And she called this book life-changing and said that she still got so much out of it. So Gina's quoted in, in this article, I want you but I can't afford you, along with a few other people. It was an interesting read, but I felt that there was a few gaps. Oh, just a few? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Gina's contribution to this article, I felt, was the best part of this article. So let's talk about the article a bit first, and then I want to talk a bit about Gina's book. Yeah. The huge problem I have with this article is that you are making the problem worse if you keep framing parenthood as only being a problem or something for mothers to focus on and consider. There are some things that are specific to motherhood. Yes, absolutely. I will always want to have and make time and space for specifically women to talk about their experiences of motherhood. But what this article is trying to do is talk about economics and the lack of sort of social infrastructure, including but not limited to early childhood education and care. And a huge part of that conversation that continues to be a problem is this attitude we have that it's women who are presumed to do the labor in the household and that providing early childhood education and care is a handout to mums instead of something that is in the best interests of the child. And the heading for the article online is, are women being priced out of motherhood? And it really frustrates me because I think you could have gotten a much better and more rigorous and juicy and interesting article if you ask the question, are people being priced out of parenthood? I agree. I also think that some of the examples that she used were not actually examples of people being priced out of parenthood. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you might hate this as well. Yeah. Yeah. Because she, so one example was someone saying, I could have the kid, but I wouldn't be able to afford going on holidays and I would completely lose my social life. Um, I can't afford to have a social life and a kid. And I thought, well, you can afford to have a kid. Yeah. Like if those like those things, it it's been a reality, I'm sure, for absolutely for decades, if not centuries, if not for millennia, yeah. in a lot of cultures that when you have a baby, you can't do stuff. Do things. You have to sacrifice some things. Yeah. Personal things, social life, definitely one of them. And if you're choosing, if you're saying I can't have a child because I wouldn't be able to afford to go on holiday. Well, I just don't really think that you want a child. Which is fine. Which is fine, but don't say it's because you can't afford it when it is like the price of it and the cost of it is such an issue and it is a really terrible thing for, you know, children to basically become a luxury item. That doesn't mean that all poor people aren't going to have a child. It means that when poor people have babies that they're going to become even more entrenched in poverty. Yeah. Which is which? This article doesn't go into at all. And the other example, which I think you can't. Sorry, you can't have an article like this if it doesn't go yeah, into that. Exactly. And the other example that it had was someone um, was saying that to afford to have a child, they had to take on a huge mortgage, which then limited the spending money, the disposable income that they would have. And I just thought, you're not. If you can take on a huge mortgage, you are actually very lucky in 2023 because you're not it's not going to it, yes you it can be difficult stressful and you're going to be hamstrung for years but it's not going to be a huge mortgage forever it's going to be something that is paid down and it's going to be your security when you're older as well so i thought that some of the examples were a bit they were funny i remember like one of the and obviously Maybe we should be more clear about this in case this episode of the podcast is the first thing anyone's ever heard from either of us we both are like 
full in support of universal from birth and free and good early childhood education and care. Also, I think that all of my hex debt should be wiped when I have a (laughs) second child. Also, I think the state should pay me to have children. (laughs) There was, so for example, one of the other people, the author of this article spoke to said that they work at an, was it like an art gallery or a museum? A museum, yes. Where it was like well known that people either at that institution or in that sector were paid pretty badly. And I just felt like there was an accumulation of sources here who were across a, what, like a sort of cross section of the middle class who had made decisions about the kind of people they want to be, which is all fine and good. Like, for example, the person who works at a museum, they've obviously chosen a line of work that they are aware of as like not bringing home as much bacon as something else could have. And they do that work because it brings them like artistic and individual and creative fulfillment. That all the people she spoke to have like university degrees. They often had mortgages. There was even one person who the author spoke to who was like a freelance writer. Like everyone deserves a living wage and everyone should be able to afford to have a child. But if your article is about whether or not people are actually being priced out of parenthood, it is like an oversight to the point of absurdity and maybe questionable ethics that you are not actually going anywhere outside of the middle class. I I had that. That was my initial reaction as well. And then when I thought a little bit more about it, I thought even though it feels a bit icky and feels a bit yuck and you always know that there are more people much, much, much worse off, it still is an interesting issue to interrogate if the middle class can't afford to have kids. And I think you can – keep it that narrow if you do it really well, like if you're yeah. very clear that you're keeping it that narrow and why that nar- that narrowness is an issue. And I would have read that article and yeah. been – She didn't what- pull it off though. No. I would have been – and I am fascinated by that. I've Like I've said it before somewhere, like I could spend my entire writing career – like dissecting the like fascinating sort of differences in the Australia's very kind of large middle class. I find it fascinating and it's worth dissecting, but you have to be explicit that that's what you're doing and you have to be able to articulate why that's worthy. Exactly. You have to articulate why you're doing it. Of exactly. interrogation. Oh, yeah, and she didn't pull it off. The other article that I saw everyone sharing that was also about babies, it was like babies, man, really on the brain. <laughs> Maybe it's because we're – friends with people in their 30s and that's who we're watching share all the articles. <laughs> yes, I was thinking about this. <laughs> it was titled Having a Kid at the End of the World and it was in the cut. And Gina was also interviewed in this. Well done, Gina and Gina's publicist. Yeah. <laughs> this book is getting a great run in the UK yeah. and in America because um, Stylist article was UK. This was an American article. It was a lot shorter And I thought it was interesting. It was about this woman was pregnant with her third child and it was basically wrestling with the idea that the world that you're birthing your children into is not going to be the world that exists in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. What is their future on this planet going to look like? And how can you do it? And she was writing about it because she was – pregnant in the last few months just when the Northern Hemisphere has had all those fires and she w- she was in Canada breathing all the smoke thinking about her baby, which is also what happened to me. Mm. In the 2019 bushfires, I was pregnant with my second child and going from like first to second trimester and I remember very viscerally the feeling of dread around it all and stress that I was damaging my unborn baby just by breathing the air around me and figuring out strategies to, you know, stay home or breathe less or not be out when the smoke was particularly bad and worrying about, you know, what the health of my child and if I I was already damaging his health. I actually, and I also was still pregnant with him when the pandemic hit. Jesus. <laughs> So it was a very stressful pregnancy, even though it was a very healthy pregnancy overall. But, you know, there was a lot of stress going on. And I was, I actually, I don't think I have ever been so stressed in my life as when I, as I was when COVID hit and I was pregnant. 
And um, I remember my brother, who's an ICU nurse, been over at my house as we realized we were going to go into lockdown and not see each other. And I think he had he hadn't got COVID patients yet in that Sydney ICU, but they were were setting up for them to come. And he came to visit me for a last time because obviously there's no vaccine. So he said, I'm not, while I'm treating patients, I'm not going to see any, well, basically anyone, but particularly you. And I was like, yeah, okay. And we had, we had like a fun day. But I remember very clearly saying to him, I can't believe I'm pregnant in a global health pandemic. And Seamus going, I can't believe I'm an ICU nurse in a global health pandemic. (laughs) Anyway, it it was so stressful. And I remember, um, saying to Rick Morton, our mutual friend, I was like, oh, I'm so stressed about, you know, what if I got COVID, having to give birth alone or, you know, the bushfires, have I done damage to my baby? Is the planet burning? And I'm not usually someone in this mindset at all. And I was- Well, Bridie Jabour, famously the only millennial without anxiety. Exactly. Yeah. I was I was like, is this what anxiety feels like? <laughs> and I was saying to Rick, and on top of everything, I'm so stressed, I can't sleep. I obviously couldn't take anything for that. And I said, and I think that I'm doing even more damage to this baby. Like, what if me being stressed is hurting this baby? To which Rick replies, matter of factly, oh, yeah, there's studies done that stress hormones can be extremely damaging for a fetus. (laughs) What an oath. Thanks for the comforting words, Rick. (laughs) But anyway, so it's all very interesting to me. And I remember so vividly how it felt and obviously feel pretty fine now, even though the world is still burning, but you know, we've got to get up each day and go go to work anyway and raise our kids. They're here now, so I've got to keep them. And uh, this article I thought went into it really well and also did go into why people continue to have babies and um, made the point, which I love it when this point is made, that people have had babies under incredibly stressful and uncertain situations Mm. for centuries. This is probably not the most stressful time in history, certainly not the most stressful country to be in or situation to be in to have babies. People have done it before and we'll keep doing it because we want to have hope is kind of the... Is that why people have babies? I think people have babies even when they're stressed about the state of the world and that the world could change a lot and that it might not be safe. The reason that you end up still making the decision, even though academically and intellectually it doesn't seem like a very wise decision, because if you're having a baby, there is obviously part of you that hopes that it's gonna that things are gonna change, that it is gonna be okay, that the world is gonna become a better place and that you're gonna do a good job. You look Hot, terrified. I'm not terrified. I'm fucking baffled. Like I have to be careful about how I talk about this subject matter in public because I, I still truly profoundly do not understand the drive to reproduce. You don't? Why no. do you think people have babies? That, well, it's what I fucking just asked you because I got no clue. Because, well, I think, I think part, of we're it, animals. part of it you have hope. Yeah, because you're animals and also because what is the point of life if not for love and community? But don't that's like a choice that you can make to have in the life that you have now. Yeah, but it can be more fun with a baby. It's also there is a degree of narcissism. Yeah, see, mm, here we go. I, 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 wanted here to, we go. I wanted to see my little mini-me's and what my little mini-me's are like. And also for me, <laughs> a big my little mini-me's are absolutely pains in the balls this week. <laughs> my little mini-me's have ruined my skin, <laughs> ruined my sleep. Ruined my finances. <laughs> and you're like, how come you how come you don't understand why people don't want babies? It is. It's a leap of faith. It's an act of faith. And you, you do it to create more love. And there is a degree of narcissism as well. And also for me, there was a big element of curiosity. This is the uh, one. Okay. This I was is, like, I yeah. wanna I wanna know what being pregnant's like. Sucks. I want to know what having a baby is like. Like I am someone who likes to experience every single thing and there was an element of it being one of the experiences that I could have. I do agree with that. I am truly fascinated by um, the process of like language acquisition and like cognitive developmental learning and when they get words and when they get sentences and object permanence, like that stuff is fascinating. I find that interesting to a degree, but I'm more interested in the question of, are you born with your personality yeah. or does your parent, or what makes your personality? And growing up in my family, like my brothers and sisters, we are so different to each other in some ways in our personalities. Yeah. I think you just must be born with it. Yeah. My brother and I are completely different. Yeah. And then looking at my boys, it is amazing. Like they're really close in age, two and a half years, 
same parents, pretty much, they're both born into pretty much the same circumstances, situations, raised pretty much the same, and they are so different. Before we finish talking about this, I want to give another shout out to Gina's book. So I interviewed Gina for the B List book club that I used to run at the State Library about this book. It's called, again, The Most Important Job in the World. That's what it's called here in Australia. It's been out for like a year and a bit. It's only just coming out now. You can still find it in Big W, every good oh, bookstore, Big W. It's still, I still see it around everywhere. Because, so like we've touched on the sort of economic arguments about, you know, people choosing whether or not to try to have a child. There are seven chapters. I'm just going to read out the chapter headings. So there's reproductive rights, climate change, reproductive justice, which is different. And we haven't even mentioned here that Gina Rushton did years and years of reporting and still does a bit of reporting on um, like abortion access in Australia. She has done huge legwork around the country on that issue. And then work, emotional labor, legacies, and fertility. What I think this book achieved so extraordinarily is that it gradually and cumulatively showed how all of those separate threads do come together. And I think that's why you mentioned like you already had kids and it changed your perspective and somebody who has decided they're definitely not having kids, it changed their perspective. But it was also just really conversational and funny. And I want to read this one bit that I had pulled out to read out to the crowd when I interviewed Gina because she talks about emotional labor and what that term originally mean and what we now mean when we use it and it's become sort of quite mainstream and I'm quoting verbatim from her it can be hard under capitalism to evaluate emotional labor without be becoming a resentful ledger keeper who sees love and care as commodities to be transacted but there's an undeniable atmosphere in which, for many women in relationships with men, the thought of starting a family feels daunting because they are already depleted by the relationship, however loving. <laughs> <laughs> How fucked is that? But it's so true. It's very true. And on that brutal note. Brutal. <laughs> Smack we will, down. <laughs> we'll link to the articles that we discussed and also – Gina's books. Mm. What are you going to be doing for the rest of the week? I'm going to the opening night of um, Sydney Theatre Company's new show of The Importance of Being Earnest. Oh, which I, I am, so wanted to go to. Well, I invited you and you said no. <laughs> because what I'll be doing this week is my sister and her daughter arrive tomorrow. Oh, fun. So uh, we're, we're spending the weekend together. She's going to, you know, I'm going to get to see my niece who I love, my baby. I call her my baby. I'll be looking after for a bit while my sister goes off and does fun things and then we're going to a really nice restaurant on Saturday night. Ooh. So I'm still doing something fun on Saturday night. Don't cry for me, Brie. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Cool Story with Brie and Bridie. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a five-star rating and review while you're there. We read them all. This episode has been produced by Sam Devonport, who we thank very much. And you can also find us on Instagram at Cool Story Brie Bridie. See you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye.